So um, actually this talk is not gonna be a whole bunch on kind of repertoire sequencing um, in kind of the, the way people have been talking about it so far. It's more monoclonal isolation. So um, before we start, just like everybody else, we have a couple of uh, places where we can talk about all of our data. So I'm part of, um, my lab is part of the uh, Center for Viral Systems Biology or CVISB. Um, some people call it CBiscuit. We can't really pronounce the, the, um, the acronym, so we probably should have thought about that before we decided on it. Um, but we do have a data portal, so it's data.cvisb.org. Um, and so we do a lot more than just SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we also do um, hemorrhagic fever work, which was actually the, um, that was the initial focus of the grant. We've expanded um, to SARS-CoV-2. Um, but we have a whole lot of data there beyond just antibody stuff. So we have um, uh, people as part of our center that are doing viral sequencing. So we have a ton of viral genomes for SARS-CoV-2. Um, we have um, uh, uh, system serology work uh, by Galit Alter's lab. Um, she's also part of the CVSB. So there's a ton of data there that's not just limited to antibody repertoire stuff. Um, and uh, the informatics, uh, the data uh, part of our uh, CVSB group uh, also launched a website that I think is really, really cool called outbreak.info. Um, and it's a kind of a resource that just aggregates as much information as they can and makes it as user friendly as possible. So they have a ton of information about um, epidemiology, of course, that's kind of the um, focus of a lot of um, uh, work now, and there's a lot of dashboards that are focused in that area, but they also have um, uh, a lot of resources for uh, searching through publications and, um, and finding data sets, finding protocols that groups have used, um, all focused on uh, COVID-19 kind of areas. So I think those, both of those are, um, if you add those to your list of um, and dashboards and databases of SARS information, I think as we get farther into this, just finding information is actually becoming the hard part because there's just so much of it. Um, and also before we really get going, I'd like to talk about the group that was involved. There was a lot of people that did a lot of work um, as part of this project, um, primarily at three institutions, um, UCSD, um, which is our clinical collaborator, which where we were able to get uh, the samples we used, um, Scripps Research, and as well as IAVI. Um, so just to start, um, um, so Brian, sorry to interrupt, uh, would you mind putting your presentation into um, presentation mode? Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. Let's see here. Better? Nice. Thank Great. you. Wonderful. Uh, so, um, so one of the first things we had to do when we were trying to discover these antibodies is build the reagents. So there wasn't really much in the way of uh, reagents for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so uh, in addition to making recombinant proteins, so stabilized versions of the um, CoV-2 spike um, and, um, and the RBD, uh, we also developed uh, neutralization assays for SARS-CoV-2. So we had two assays. One was a uh, live virus um, assay, a live replicating virus that was plat counting. And we also had a luciferase-based uh, uh, pseudovirus assay. So the luciferase assay is essentially uh, the HIV pseudovirus, uh, but with uh, SARS-CoV-2 spike on the surface rather than um, HIV envelope. So um, we did see an extremely good correlation between the two. Um, uh, and actually on the right, what you can see is not the correlation between the pseudovirus and, um, and uh, live virus, which is even better than this correlation, but this is uh, one of the things that we found, uh, which we thought was most interesting, was that uh, the pseudovirus neutralization assay correlated best in terms of binding uh, with RBD. So that was data we had just based on um, uh, the first few antibodies, but I'm gonna get a little more into that later. But um, for us, that was very exciting because we wanted to isolate these antibodies um, by uh, flow cytometry and not using functional assay. So we can use binding, but we can't really use a neutralization assay by flow. So the fact that um, a binding to RBD correlated very well with neutralization was encouraging for us. So we had a cohort um, of, I believe it's about 20 individuals. Um, so we did um, plasma uh, functional assays for these subjects to narrow down the subjects we were most interested in isolating monoclonal antibodies from. Um, so as you can see, um, the three subjects that we isolated antibodies from are in color. The others are uh, in gray. Um, so we have 
three subjects that we isolated monoclonals from. Uh, and as you can see, the, dark, the solid lines are uh, the spike protein and the dashed lines are just BSA. So you can see that um, all of the subjects that were um, infected and convalescent at this point um, uh, are pretty strongly positive on ELISA for both SARS and many of them were also positive for SARS-CoV-1 as well. Um, uh, if we look at RBD, we can see that this is where we start to distinguish the subjects. So uh, most of the subjects, especially particularly the ones that we focused on for monoclonal isolation, had strong uh, SARS-CoV-2 RBD binding titers, um, whereas the binding titers to RBD, uh, SARS-CoV-1 RBD were much lower. Um, and that uh, corresponds very nicely with the variability in uh, the SARS uh, spike. Um, you see a lot more variability um, in the RBD uh, as compared to kind of the stock or the, the base of the, of the spike. Um, so when we look at uh, neutralization assay from, again, this is from plasma, um, we see that uh, you can see why we selected the subjects we did. These all have um, among the highest titers of neutralization, uh, plasma neutralization um, against SARS-CoV-2. And again, virtually all subjects have uh, uh, minimal, if, if any, neutralization of SARS-CoV-1. Um, so, uh, interestingly, we saw several individuals that didn't have much in the way of neutralization against SARS-CoV-2. Um, that, I don't have the data slide here, but that does correlate with the date of sampling. So, we tended to, the individuals that had the, uh, the lowest neutralizing titers tended to be those subjects that we isolated um, or uh, drew blood from earliest following symptomology. So, those are usually in the week or so post-symptom onset. So they're still, although they don't have any symptoms, they may have been um, uh, still too early to detect robust neutralization titers in the plasma. Um, so again, this is uh, the same thing I just showed, but these are the three subjects we selected for isolating monoclonals. Um, and so there was one other subject, I don't know if you guys can see my pointer, but this, this uh, subject here, um, we were unable to draw them, uh, that, that particular woman, um, a second time. So we got a very small aliquot to do um, uh, plasma uh, serology work, but we're not able to get another subsequent donation. So interestingly, that subject also was the most cross-reactive. So unfortunately, we may not have the, the antibodies we were actually looking for, but we did find some very good ones. So just, to, just um, a little bit about the SARS-2 spike, and I'm sure most of you know this. Um, so the SARS spike is shown here on the left. It's a, it's a trimer um, of heterodimers, um, much like uh, a lot of other proteins, influenza HIV, for example. Um, and, and, but uniquely, the RBD portion, the head, I guess you could call it, of the spike uh, can either be in the up or down confirmation. And it's not necessarily that all are up or all are down. You can get some spikes. There seems to be some flexibility here. And that flexibility may be because our antigen uh, constructs are not accurate. Um, but it does appear um, that at least there is a mix of confirmations where the three RBD protomers can be either in the up or down confirmation. Um, and so uh, you can see that uh, like many other uh, viral fusion proteins, uh, the head domain has an area that's accessible um, and an area that would, in, in the native trimeric form, be occluded. So that would be, um, in many cases, you see, uh, this, in this case, it's the gray area. You see antibody responses against that region, but of course, those would be non-functional in terms of neutralization because that area of the protein would be uh, buried in the spike. So, uh, oops. So one thing to note, and we were a little bit, uh, not necessarily surprised, but we were hoping it'd be better. Um, we uh, sorted, expressed in microculture, and uh, did uh, binding and neutralization assays of over 2,000 IgGs, um, IgG antibodies. And uh, this slide was actually made um, <laughs> for the paper which didn't include some of the subjects that we had, were finishing as we were writing the paper. Um, but uh, what, one thing that we did notice was that uh, an extremely small number of antibodies that were positive by flow cytometry actually ended up neutralizing. One thing that was interesting as well, um, and I think this is you know, one of the main focuses of 
um, what I'm going to talk about here is that the RVD seems to be where the action is in terms of neutralization. So overall, we saw a fairly small number of neutralizers, about 2% um, on average per subject of the antibodies we're neutralizing um, against uh, uh, the RVD. And of course, um, antibodies that recognize the RBD would be expected to also recognize the spike protein since RBD is part of the spike protein. Um, but uh, the fraction of binders to neutralizers was about 30% or so. Um, whereas if you look at the spike, um, antibodies that bound to the spike but not to the RBD, um, you see that you know, about 5% of the binding antibodies ended up being neutralizing. So it appears that either uh, the spike protein uh, has uh, is much more immunogenic in the sense that it elicits strong antibody responses, but it, most of the epitopes are um, are non neutralizing, or that uh, that there are a lot of um, misfolded or um, uh, malformed spikes that expose uh, spike only epitopes either on the surface of the virus or um, to the immune system and you end up getting a lot of antibodies against what's essentially junk. And the junk tends to be composed mostly of spike only epitopes. Um, so uh, we tested these antibodies, all of them for neutralization, and we found uh, a panel of antibodies that were able to neutralize. Uh, so these are from uh, two subjects. CC, all the antibodies that say CC12 are from one subject. Whoops. Uh, and ones that say CC6 are from another. And then CR3022 um, is a SARS-CoV-1 antibody that's, that was um, isolated, I believe, by Crucell, part of Johnson & Johnson. So uh, the most potent of the antibodies, and this is in terms of micrograms per mil, are in the uh, roughly uh, 1 to 10 uh, micrograms per mil range as the most potent, which is uh, very potent, especially considering this is um, pretty recent following infection. We're not waiting you know, three to six months to get like the most mature memory response we could get. Um, so epitope mapping these antibodies um, using competition, uh, we, re we discovered that there were three uh, epitopes each on the RBD and the spike. So the bulk of the response appears to be against the epitope we're calling RBDA. Um, there are two other epitopes, interestingly, um, interestingly, but not necessarily surprisingly, because 3022 um, is a SARS-CoV-1 antibody, did not seem to overlap epitope-wise with um, any of the antibodies we discovered. Um, both subjects made antibodies against both RBD epitopes. Um, and also, if you look at the neutralization profiles by epitope, you can see that you know, the bulk of the activity is against the RBD epitopes, RBDA uh, in particular. Those tend to be the highest um, potency antibodies um, we do see kind of minor neutralization happening, um, very weak neutralization against non-RBD epitopes on the S protein. But for the most part, it appears that the neutralizing activity is directed at um, the RBD. Again, so a big caveat here, of course, is that we're using a stabilized soluble spike protein, right? So there's definitely the, possible, the, the possibility that our antigen bait is essentially biasing our result, right? So we may, if, if our antigen bait is well-formed at the RBD portion of it, but is less native-like um, on other spike epitopes, we might be missing a lot of neutralizing activity um, against the spike protein uh, because our antigen that we use for flow sorting is uh, suboptimal. Although we did see that in the subjects with the best neutralizing activity, um, in their plasma. Those also did correlate very well with RBD binding. So although we may be missing some things, it, the neutralization profiles are not in conflict uh, of the monoclonal antibodies, don't conflict with what we saw in the plasma. So we're reasonably confident that although we might be missing some things that are non-RBD spike, it does uh, uh, you know, uh, correspond to the plasma data that most of the neutralizing activity is directed at RBD. Um, also, interestingly, if you look at the neutralizing antibodies against the RBD A epitope, um, when we compete those with ACE2, um, so we basically put in uh, SAR, the SARS RBD with ACE2 and then measure the inhibition of binding, um, that how much binding uh, ACE2 prevents. 
And you see a very nice correlation between neutralization potency and competition by ACE2. There's one little outlier guy here, but for the most part, um, it looks like neutralizing activity um, is, correlates very well with the extent to which um, SARS uh, and ACE2 occupy the same binding site. So it does appear that neutralization, the mechanism of neutralization is um, essentially receptor blocking. Uh, and this is the same uh, slide again, but now we have a filled uh, model. And again, so I mentioned this earlier. Uh, if you look at the RBD, which is here in gray, and ACE2, which is in blue, again, we're looking for inhibition of ACE2 binding, right? If you look at the level of conservation um, between SARS-1 and SARS-2, um, the conserved residues are in gray and the different residues are in orange, you see a huge amount of variability at the ACE2 binding site. So if antibodies that neutralize most potently um, are competing most directly with ACE2 binding, it appears that that area on the SARS-2 RBD is one of the more variable regions on the spike. So uh, it's not totally clear how you get so much variation at the receptor binding site. In, in a lot of cases, you'd expect that site to be the most conserved. Um, but it, it, it does appear that there are a, a small number of conserved residues that are responsible for binding, but a lot of variability surrounding those conserved residues. So you get a lot of um, uh, variation between SARS-1 and 2 at, at the particular sites of most potent neutralization, which is why we see minimal cross-reactivity uh, between SARS-1 and SARS-2. So then uh, we tested two of our favorite antibodies um, against, uh, against challenge in a Syrian hamster model. So Syrian hamsters we selected as a model uh, because they, um, although they're not a great model of human immunity, they're a decent model of SARS infection. They get sick in a manner similar to humans, um, more similar than you'd expect in macaques. So you can measure um, uh, uh, infection by weight loss uh, fairly easily in these animals. So if you look at the two antibodies that we used, um, we picked uh, one of the more potent antibodies and then a, a second antibody, which was also, it's one of the more potent antibodies against the S, the non-RBD S protein. So um, both of them were from the same subject. And so the general gist of the experiment is that we did um, uh, IP antibody delivery, uh, about 12 hours before we did intranasal um, expo challenge with SARS um, and uh, bled at day zero, bled again at day five and measured weight loss across, um, across that time frame. So uh, if you look at the results here, we did two measures of, um, of uh, response to challenge. One would be weight change uh, at day five and the second was lung viral titers also at the same time point. So as you can see in the highest dose, um, we saw essentially complete protection. At, both, at the two highest doses, we saw essentially complete protection in terms of weight change. Um, and by, um, as we get down into the, the lower doses, we see essentially um, uh, the same result as a control. Um, one thing we did notice that we were, um, reasonably excited about was that we didn't see really much in the way of evidence of ADE. So at the time we were doing this, there was a lot of concern about antibody dependent enhancement. Um, that typically tends to happen at sub neutralizing concentrations. Um, so as you can see at this point here where we, do, where we are at sub protective concentrations, we don't really see much in the way of evidence for um, uh, enhancement of infection. And we see the same thing um, if we look at the lung viral titers. So the control, um, we, uh, the titers in the control. Um, one interesting thing that we are, we're not totally sure what's happening, but we think we have a hypothesis, is that although we did see uh, variation in clinical outcomes of the mice from the highest dose to the third highest dose, we didn't really see much in the way of viral RNA copies. And we think that, that the reason is because um, this is just the baseline level of detection um, and what the RNA that's left um, in the 2000 um, microgram dose is the challenge, residual challenge, that may be um, neutralized virus that still has intact genome. We're not totally sure, but we don't see much in the way of uh, difference in lung viral titers. But again, uh, in the lowest dose animals, we don't see any real evidence of antibody-dependent enhancement, which was, um, again, at the time, something we were 
pretty concerned about with using antibodies as potential therapeutics. Uh, so the other antibody, which is uh, the spike antibody not, uh, that was not against the RVD, does not protect at all. Um, we saw essentially no protection in this antibody, even at the highest uh, 2,000 microgram dose. So that, again, correlates reasonably well with the neutralization. This is a much less potent antibody, so um, we wouldn't necessarily expect it to, to protect as well. Although we do see in cases like dengue, uh, like uh, Ebola, for example, um, neutralization potency, um, Erica Sapphire has shown this data quite, quite a bit. Um, neutralization potency in in vitro assays doesn't necessarily correlate to in vivo protection. So in this case, our case of two antibodies, it does. But again, also encouragingly, we saw no evidence of um, ADE in this antibody that was neutralizing um, in vitro, but you know, clearly not protected in vivo. Um, and that's, uh, so one summary slide here before we go. Um, so we have screened a total of 17 donors. Um, three subjects um, were selected um, for uh, flow cytometric sorting of an antigen-specific antibodies. Um, so of 2,000 antibodies, only 33 show detectable neutralization, and many of those were um, uh, pretty weak, really only a handful of antibodies. Uh, that were potently neutralizing from about 2,000 antibodies that were selected. Um, we identified six potentially distinct antibody epitopes, um, neutralizing antibody epitopes on the S protein. Uh, the three in the RBD domain are, are the most potent, particularly RBDA. Um, and uh, I didn't show the data on here, but um, RBDB uh, potentially have more, uh, have more potential cross-reactivity with SARS-CoV-1, um, both that again matches um, what we think um, conservation is between the two proteins. Um, but even then, the cross-reactivity is pretty minimal. You get a, a large drop-off in potency from SARS-CoV-2 to SARS-CoV-1. Um, and finally, the Syrian hamster model um, was was able to show protection from disease with the potent RBDA antibody, but not with the less potent spike protein antibody. And last, once again, um, our, the acknowledgments. This was a big collaboration, a lot of people. Um, and this is, you know, it seems like every once in a while we get into one of these cases where it's uh, speed is paramount. So a lot of these people were working, you know, essentially around the clock um, for several weeks, starting in um, uh, February, March of this year, and through till about August. So um, a huge amount of work from a lot of people that worked very hard. Uh, my group in particular, Jonathan Hurtado, has been great. Um, there's a lot of data we didn't show here um, because it's not quite ready yet. Um, but one of the things that he developed in our lab was, um, uh, if any of you have heard of LibreSeq, we've adapted LibreSeq, I think, and improved it in a couple of ways. Um, but I've also been using uh, the antigen barcoding um, to perform pseudo neutralization assays. So we can put in pre-conjugated spike and um, ACE2 um, together with separately barcoded spike and look for differential binding between receptor bound spike versus non-receptor bound spike to identify those antibodies that essentially perform a competition assay in a 10X uh, run, right? So we can get uh, pretty detailed readouts of an antigen specificity using that. So that data is still a work in process and we can't quite talk about it. We're working, we're working with 10X, so we're not allowed to talk about that stuff just yet. So that's coming soon. Hopefully we'll be able to share more of that data. And as soon as it's available, obviously we'll make the data available to everybody here. So thank you very much. And I'd be uh, more than happy to take questions. Great, well, thank you very much, Brian. Here we go, virtual applause. Um, uh, so that was really awesome, really nice presentation. We have a couple questions coming in on the Q&A, so why don't we start off with those. One is from Zichan Zhu, uh, very nice presentation. I want to ask whether your group uh, has checked the epitope of these um, spike binding but non-RBD uh, neutralizing antibodies like NTD. How, how is the, what is the numerical ratio between RBD neutralizing antibody and spike neutralizing antibody in your uh, 2018 antibodies. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the number of spike binding antibodies is far higher than the number of RBD specific binding antibodies. So things that bind spike, I mean, the, the, I think it's approaching 10 to 1, 
right, in terms of um, by flow cytometry. We've been having some trouble with structures of the um, spike non-RBD binding antibody. So it turns out, in many cases, if you mix the spike antibody and the spike protein, uh, essentially the spike falls apart and is not very um, homogenous. So you can't get both crystal structures or EM. We don't get very, we can't even get much in the way of EM either. So that's been something of a struggle. So in terms of mapping those epitopes um, by structure, which is I think the fastest way to do it these days, which is surprising. It used to be that you'd have to make uh, you know a, a knockout panel and that's the fastest way, but now structures have gotten so much, the structural people have done so much that it's now faster to do EM, I think. So we're in the process of doing, um, uh, making knockout panels that we can then maybe map those in a better way. But at this point, we don't have much in the way of epitope mapping beside the competition stuff. I mean, it's really interesting in that connection that the RBD is so underrepresented though. Do you think that that's, um, that that's real or just an artifact of, of the antigen that you're using? Yeah, it's hard to tell. And at first we thought, well, you know, since the plasma had, you know, if, if you have more new, you have more RBD, we thought, well, that kind of helps. But now that we look at um, the spike protein basically falling apart when we mix these spike antibodies for, for structure, we think that maybe there could be some improvements in the antigen that could maybe give us a lot of other stuff. And again, like HIV and other if flu, for example, maybe functional assays are the best choice, right? Looking at neutralization directly rather than looking at binding as a surrogate for neutralization. Yeah. Right. But to sort of tie this back into repertoire, I mean, it seems like a lot of the repertoire studies that have been done that look um, in detail in individuals show fair bit of constriction in terms of the, for instance, the V gene usage of anti-RBD antibodies, right? So is yep. it possible that there could be kind of a hole in the repertoire or that it's hard to make RBD antibodies? Or do you really think the whole thing is just technical and that um, it's just a problem with the antigens? It's very possible. I'm not sure. So there's there's like seven different things that it could be, right? So we've right. seen also, we see um, 353 and 366 are pretty overrepresented, especially compared to the rest of the repertoire. We see a lot more of that than you'd expect if it was a random thing. Right. Um, and, you know, so like you see in a lot of other pathogens, you can definitely have antibodies where CDR1 and 2 are pre-configured, if you'd like, um, to, you know, be better suited for this particular epitope. Um, but you could also see the potential for antibodies that have, you um, with somatic mutation can do a much better job by incorporating the CDR3 and maybe the angle of approach is better because you're not relying heavily on these pre-configured CDR1 and 2. So I think there's definitely a lot more to go. I think the most we can say now is that with the baits we have, we're pulling out uh, a small number of RBD antibodies uh, that tend to be very potent in, in neutralization, but that that's only you know a few weeks post infection. So there's definitely a, a, so Dennis, who is my postdoc mentor, likes to talk about it as like high ceiling or high floor, low ceiling, right? You have yeah. these antibodies that at right. germline are pretty pretty well suited to binding um, certain pathogens, but they may not have a lot of room to get better, right? So you see this initial response that's pretty good but not great. And you have these other antibodies that have a low floor and a high ceiling, which they're pretty low if any to start, but they have a ton of room to grow. So mm -hmm. you know, two or three months after infection, while the germinal centers have had time to churn away on these antigens for quite a long time, those antibodies might get much, much better than the ones we're seeing now. So I right. think looking at infected patients six months after into convalescence might tell a totally different story than we're seeing here. Yeah, that, that's a crucial point. I love that. That's great for the panel discussion too, which I, we're kind of great, gradually morphing into, but um, I wanted to get a few more questions out of Q&A. So Jamie Scott asks, would you expect to see uh, antibody dependent enhancement in Syrian hamsters with human antibodies, uh, given that there may be differences in the FC gamma receptors of Syrian hamsters? Can they even bind to human IgG1s? So they they looked at that and there is some binding, but who knows, right? Yes, of course. So we're not, I mean, there's no way to know. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think one of the more traditional, I guess, ways you'd expect to have antibody dependent enhancement. I mean, dengue is the, you know, the prototype yeah. example of this is you're essentially getting infection of non-target cells, right? It, because of antibody binding. I, I don't, that hasn't been shown at all in humans yet. So I, I've yet to see data that suggests that 
cells without ACE2 are now being infected because of antibody binding. You're essentially coding and optimizing, right? Um, opsonizing and, and, and uptaking a virus into cells that wouldn't normally be able to be entered. I, I haven't seen data of that yet. So there may be a different mechanism, um, but yeah, you're, that's also a good, a good point is that we may not expect to see a ton of ADE in um, a model where the FC binding isn't necessarily um, uh, optimal. Sure, great. Um, another question comes from Jamie also. Did you analyze the transcriptomes and or the B cell plasma cell repertoires of antigen specific cells from COVID-19 patients? And if so, did you see anything of interest when you did that? Yeah, so that's all ongoing. Um, so we, one of the things we did first, and this, we thought we were so clever, but it ended up being not a great idea, um, is we uh, had some acute patients. So again, this is right at the beginning, this is in February. So we're thinking, oh my gosh, we've got acute patients. We can make antibodies super fast. We'll turn them around. It's going to be amazing. And we'll change science forever. And so what we ended up doing is we sorted a bunch of plasma blasts, did 10x on them. And in parallel with the same 10x library, did uh, a yeast display. Um, so in that case, you're mixing and matching heavy and light, right? But we have the natively paired sequences by 10X. So the sure. idea is if you pull out a heavy chain, potentially with a bunch of light chains, right? By selection of the phage or the yeast display, we can tell you which one of those light chains is the correct light chain by 10X, right? <laughs> so as it turns out, the uh, plasma blast response is overwhelmingly non-neutralizing and basically <laughs> yeah. low affinity, right? And the right. only things you pull out tend to be really weakly neutralizing, cross-reactive, seasonal probably stuff. So that ended up not working the way we hoped it would work. Um, but 10x on, on convalescent patients is happening now also, yeah. Right. Yeah, and I think you're, you're again. It, it gets back to the point that we've. That this is one of the overarching themes, really, is that the. Uh, you know what we're you see what you look for when you look for it right and and so a lot of the initial studies including ours where we're focusing early on in the course of the disease um yeah you see a lot of extra follicular responses but that's yeah. kind of what the immune system does initially probably early on in, in a lot of severe infections and if we had the luxury of time and had more access to you know people with less uh, more remote infection which we're now starting to get uh, then mm -hmm. we can really look at it in this other way so yeah, and so, early, yeah go ahead. Know, is, oh, there's advantages to that also right i mean plasma blasts are an unbiased way of looking at antigen specific responses as a surrogate right you don't have to, you're not relying on baits necessarily to narrow down the population for you you're relying on phenotype so you know if if the initial response were great, or you know, I don't know if there's going to be reinfection, but if you, you know, next year, if there's people that get SARS-CoV-2 again, potentially their plasma blast is going to be a recall response, um, right. and that would be less limited by our antigen baits, you know, for selection. But yeah, right, fantastic. Um, we do have one other question for you, and then I think we could go in from there into the panel discussion. So the last question comes from Yoshi Nobu. Kogushi, I apologize for how I'm saying your name. Um, do your neutralizing anti-RBD antibodies accumulate any SHM? Uh, yes, so I don't, I can actually, I think I have a slide for that. Hang on, I think if I'm still sharing, am I still sharing my screen? Yep, yeah. you're still sharing your screen, which is great. So you have a, uh, a slide on that that I, I didn't show. It was, it's in the paper. So I, did, I tried to show some slides, <laughs> focus a little bit, as much as I could on slides that weren't already in the paper, right? So. Um, this is the antibodies that were most potently neutralizing that we um, characterized. So uh, you can see that we did have a lot of VH12, so, but each block here, each segment is a single lineage. So for the most part, we didn't see a lot in the way of clonal expansion. Again, probably because these subjects are pretty soon within a month after infection. So we expected if we looked at these people six months post infection, we'd see much more clonality. But in one subject, we did see one lineage that had, was pretty expanded. So that's why we see a lot of VH12s. But as a general rule, um, VH353, and we've seen this more in the 10x data subsequent to this, um, it pretty dominates the RBD response. But as you can see, this on the right is um, a mutation in the heavy chain, uh, percent nucleotide versus the light chain. And so we do see uh, between one and 3% mutation um, on average, which is not super high. Um, but 3% mutation corresponds to about 10 mutations. So they're not unmutated. They're definitely undergoing some somatic mutation. Great. 
Thank you so much. So I think with that, um, that wraps up the last of the four uh, talks. And again, Brian, uh, virtual applause here. Uh, fantastic job. And I want to just thank all of our speakers, uh, uh, apart from myself, that would be horribly self-serving. But um, I want to thank the other three speakers for giving really nice talks today. Um, and now what we'd like to do is go um, and move into the panel.